we have a full house. Um, again, my name is Kathy Palicki and I am at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. If you're not familiar with us, we're in south, uh, southeastern uh, Michigan, so we're north of the city of Detroit in Royal Oak, Michigan. 1,071 beds, um, acute care hospital with the children's hospital uh, included in that camp, that same campus. Uh, I've been there for about eight years and really have enjoyed my stay and have a, a variety of roles these days. But anyways, enough about me. Um, I'd like to um, just get a flavor for the audience. I know that this is our residency conference, but sometimes we have a whole host of other types of practitioners here. So just so I understand the lay of the land, how many of you are residents? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Any students? Great. Okay, some students. Okay. Uh, let's say uh, clinical pharmacists and specialists. A few directors of pharmacy or managers? Couple. All right, good. We have a really good span. Well, hopefully, I'm going to stretch your imagination a little bit. So, everybody, get your cup of coffee out because it's going to be early. And we're going to talk about the future, and we're going to be a little bit futuristic. And I'm going to want you to put on your thinking cap because um, I'm going to put you way out there, and then the rest of the group are going to bring you back to today and what you can do to get way out there. So, that's, uh, that's what my game plan is for today. And if I can work this. All right, so we have three learning objectives for my presentation. The first is to explain the need for the expansion of clinical services into the areas of transitions of care, define the roles in, facilitate, in facilitating the federal legislation by obtaining pharmacist provider status, and finally, how will provider status impact the role of inpatient and ambulatory care pharmacists in the transitions of care? So those are what we hope to accomplish in the next 45 minutes to an hour. So we're going to look at the future in an hour, right? How are we going to do that? There's a lot to cover. First, we're going to talk about what we think or what we're going to project in pharmacy practice for the next five years. Then what I'm going to do is we're going to start taking you way outside your comfort zone and look at what about the next 20 to 30 years and what might healthcare look like. And finally, we're going to come back down to reality and say, how do we prepare for this? So the sources that I'm going to be using, and I'm not going to quote them on every slide because they're pretty lengthy. The first source I'm going to look at, for when we study the first five years, I'm going to be focusing really on a new publication through ASHP and the foundation. It's called the Pharmacy Forecast, and um, it's the Pharmacy Forecast 2013 through 2017. It's available at the current website. Then once we start looking at healthcare in 20 to 30 years, I'm going to look at two sources two documents and research papers that were done by the Institute for Alternative Futures. We're going to look at some real futuristic uh, views of what healthcare might look like. So let's start with the first five years in Pharmacy Forecast Trend Report uh, from ASHP. And really it's a report on environmental factors that we believe will influence our direction in pharmacy over the next five years. And it really was based on a survey of pharmacy practitioners who watch trends and people from all different avenues of our profession, academics, clinical, informatics, managerial, it's about 150 participants that received a survey to help develop this report. And again, it was supported by the Center for Health System Pharmacy Leadership through the ASHP Research and Education Foundation. So let's dig into it a little bit. Um, this, the forecast itself um, is available, out, as I said, out on the website. It's very well done, and it's really encouraged that each pharmacy department utilize this for strategic planning um, for your department in the next five years. And it's, it's separated into eight different domains, and these are areas that we believe will impact pharmacy in the next five years. Healthcare delivery and financing, pharmacy practice model, pharmacy workforce technology, drug development therapeutics, pharmaceutical marketplace, physician and nurse workforces, and also consumer-driven health care. So we believe that those are the eight areas that are really going to be impacting us as pharmacy practitioners um, through 2017. I'm not going to dig into every single detail. I kind of took snippets out of each of these different domains that apply to our topic today and to kind of give you a flavor for what trends we believe are going to happen in the next five years. There were some very, very common themes that came out through this process with these trend watchers um, all that run across the eight domains. And the first that's extremely important 
is that we need to, as practitioners, make sure that we've developed sound competencies and continual professional development. If we want to be established as a part of the patient care team and expand our role, we need to be darn sure that we have solid competency assessments within our own um, group, we have ways to develop ourselves professionally, and that they're very well documented. In addition to that, we need to make sure that we have documented how we improve patient outcomes and continuity of care. I think a couple of our presentations further down, uh, Haney's going to talk about um, her documentation of how they've improved uh, patient care at the U of M, at U of M through her clinic. So I think that that's really going to be an important lesson and, and a good theme that, that came out of this uh, uh, forecast. Also, really, pharmacists need to be a, a strong participant on patient care teams. This was another theme that came across through the trends and through what we're seeing with healthcare. Also, pharmacists need to take accountability for medication therapy outcomes, and there is really a strong push for this, that, that really we need to be accountable for what happens to our patients and the outcomes that they, they receive related to medications. And finally, we really need to document how pharmacy contributes to the overall health of our nation. So those were strong themes that came out of all eight of the domains. And finally, that um, pharmacists need to be involved in programs that improve the health of the community serviced by the, by the hospital. You're going to hear that theme throughout my talk today, that we need to be as much about managing care and medications as we are preventing people from having to go on medications. So preventative health will be a big role, I believe, for us in the next 5, 20 plus years. <clears throat> So let's delve into each of those eight domains. I'm going to try to go through them relatively quickly. Um, and I, again, I just kind of pulled out some snippets. The way I'm going to arrange it, I'm going to talk about the trends that are, we're seeing for that domain. And then we're going to talk about what the participants in the survey felt strongly are going to happen to our profession and some su suggested solutions for us along the way. So the first um, domain is the healthcare delivery and financing. And I, I hope you all have heard enough about the Affordable Care Act. It's here, it's going to stay. It keeps getting challenged in the courts, but I think it's here to stay. And really, its goal was to expand health insurance coverage and improve the quality of care. Great, lofty goal. Um, however, it is going to impose very big challenges for healthcare providers. And that's really a lot of what we're going to be speaking about today. Hospitals and health systems are actually going to face more patient volumes because you've got an aging population and you've got more people insured. And there's going to be an increased demand for quality and reductions in reimbursement. So we're going to have more patients with less resources but expect to have better quality. So pretty big lofty challenge for us in healthcare. In addition to that, it's going to require the Affordable Care Act, that there is really excellent transitions of care between inpatient and ambulatory settings. Once we start talking about financing, there's going to be capitation, there's going to be bundling of payments. So it's not going to be acute care versus ambulatory care anymore. It's going to be more of a continuum that's being paid for for health. So under this domain, what did the participants feel? What were their responses? These 150 trend watchers in pharmacy um, are experts. Believe and, and what I did is I tried to pull out anything that re received a response. More than 70% of those 150 people felt that this is a, a strong trend that we're going to be faced with. One was that three quarters of the hospitals will be under significantly greater financial stress. Kind of already stated that. I think most of us are feeling that already. I'm hearing a lot of uh, changes in workforce that are happening in many of the institutions in southeastern Michigan um, in um, relationship to the sequestration, to health care changes, to finances. Uh, a lot of changes are, we're already starting to feel that. In addition to that, an expansion of integrated systems. Um, really, the participants felt like there's going to be continued expansion of integrated systems. Integrated means integration between acute care, ambulatory care, that whole practice arena will become an integrated system. And it, they believe that more, more patients will receive care through those integrated systems. 
And finally, I already alluded to this, is that there will be uh, a greater, less fee for service and more capitation and more payment bundling. And there's already some, um, some pilot projects and some, uh, some things that are happening in the finance world with the uh, looking at bundling payment. I believe that uh, uh, renal uh, disease and uh, transplant, there's a few bundled payments that are already starting to happen. So a couple suggestions, and again, I didn't pull out all the suggestions from the forecast, is that one, we need in pharmacy, we need to plan how can we improve the continuity of care between our patients being discharged from the hospital. So we're going to, we're already starting to talk about transitions of care, because that's how we're going to be paid. So really we need to start planning for that. You're going to talk, we're going to hear from several of our speakers that their institutions have already started along that journey. And then we also need to plan how the pharmacy department will be able to contribute to the health system's focus, again, on community health and management of chronic disease. So health and managing chronic disease are going to be a real strong theme that you're going to continue to see. The next domain <coughs> has to do with our pharmacy practice model. I'm sure you've all heard about pharmacy practice model. You've probably already been working on practice model changes at your institution. The trends that we think that are going to impact our pharmacy practice model is that right now we can't sustain the growth in healthcare costs that we currently have in this nation. It is escalating and we just can't afford it anymore. Um, there is going to be a continued emphasis on patient safety and quality of care problems. It's in the news almost daily, issues with quality of care. Um, we are now being publicly reported related to our, our quality of care. There's certainly been numerous IOI reports about medication safety. There's also going to be an increased prevalence of patients with multiple comorbidities. Another challenge for us, that's another thing that we have to deal with in pharmacy with the multiple medications to deal with comorbidities. Again, an aging population is a trend we certainly will see. Also an increased use of high risk and high cost medications. And I think we've already seen that. It's only expected to escalate. And finally, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, is there's an expected insufficient number of primary care physicians. Once more and more um, individuals become insured, primary care physicians will be at a premium, if you will. So what do the forecast participants believe um, are really going to impact our pharmacy practice model, or what do we need to be prepared for? Um, and they believe that by 2017, at least 50% of the hospital pharmacists will spend 100% of their time handling complex medication-related issues. It's far different from what we see today. We also believe that pharmacists in 50% of the hospitals will be responsible for developing and ensuring compliance with evidence-based practice criteria. I think a lot of us are already doing that. It's only going to continue to increase. And finally, pharmacists in at least 25% of the hospitals will be engaged in communications with patients and outpatient providers following discharge to ensure that continuity of medication therapy um, and that it continues after they leave the acute care setting. One of the suggestions that came out of this, this area is that we need to involve pharmacists in post-discharge care coordination, get transitions of care. Keep seeing it over and over, and I think that you're going to see that theme through the rest of the presentations today. The third area that the uh, trend watchers looked at was the pharmacy workforce. What's going to happen in the next five years? Um, the pharmacist shortage has disappeared. Um, there are a few pockets across the country, specifically rural areas, that haven't realized it, but the shortage is over with. Um, the number of hospital pharmacists, I thought this was interesting, has grown by 34% since 2002. So that's good news. That means that we're able to integrate our hospital, our pharmacists in our acute care settings more into patient care and patient care teams. But we believe that there's going to continue to be a shortage of pharmacy managers and clinical coordinators and that's just going to continue. And we need leaders, we need all of you to be a leader to move us through the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, of all these trends we're seeing. So there is a big concern still related to uh, leadership. <coughs> so what do the forecast participants believe are going to be the biggest impact on these trends in pharmacy? Um, they believe that there is going to be more than an ample supply of qualified applicants for clinical specialist positions, um, that there is an ample supply of pharmacists for entry-level clinical positions. Now Dr. Kalis later today is going to talk to you about your career and getting prepared for that. So uh, 
pay attention to that because there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of competition for jobs. So um, make sure that you, you you're pretty attuned to what what uh, ideas he's giving you to prepare your career. Um, there's a couple other key facts that I, the participants voted on. They didn't reach my 70% threshold, but I included them anyways because I thought they were important. And the first is, is that 67% of the respondents believe that attracting pharmacists for positions in informatic technology is going to be a challenge. And we're going to talk about informatics and its role in way out the future. And I think you're going to see we need people who are strong clinicians who go into informatics because that's the way of the future. And that's going to be the way of healthcare. And you'll see that once we get into some more futuristic looks. In, in addition to that, 68% felt that there was going to be a large increase in the number of ambulatory care pharmacists and health systems. Again, we're talking about that integrated, expansion of integrated health care systems and transitions of care. So likely to follow that would be more and more ambulatory care pharmacists that help with those integrated systems and transitions. So the, one of the suggested strategies, and there's probably 10 or 12 of them under this category, is that we need to develop a focused plan to retain and to retool our current pharmacy staff members to ensure that they've got the skills needed as pharmacy practice and patient care evolves. So we need to focus as much on training new practitioners as we need to um, focus on training our existing practitioners and bring everybody up to speed of what's going to happen to us in the next 5 years, 10 years, 15 years. The next uh, domain uh, that they looked at in the pharmacy forecast was technology. And a few trends here. Uh, it is believed that by 2017, 2,800 hospitals, I'm sorry, currently 2,800 hospitals have received about $3.4 billion in electronic health record incentive payments. Pretty significant investment in our healthcare, in our uh, nation related to informatics and healthcare. There's a, been a move from standalone pharmacy informatics management systems to EHR. And um, so what? What does that mean? In my world, that means an awful lot. We used to have a pharmacy standalone system that we could control. Yeah, I printed out a paper NAR for the nurses, but if they didn't like how I timed something, they changed it, right? They could write all over it. Now we have an integrated electronic health system, so now I have to worry about meeting all the nursing needs related to how that record shows up. I need to meet all the needs of the physicians and how they have to prescribe and how we make it easier for them. And now we've got barcode technology, so I've got to make sure my supply chain gives them the proper medications labeled appropriately with the barcode. So our world has totally changed from what I used to be able to control the way I wanted to control it to now I have to meet a multitude of customer demands. It's a big, big change in paradigm. Um, and then there's also an increasing use in technology. We've got internet, wireless, mobile devices. I could go on and on and on. You'll see a little bit later where uh, this technology is going because I think it's really going to be kind of kind of interesting, kind of cool. So related to technology, the forecast participants, or 70% of them, believe that by 2017, most hospitals will have converted completely to an EHR. We currently are only at 86% of the hospitals. They also believe that CPOE will be the method for ordering medications in most hospitals. We're only at 30% today. So it's going to be a big shift in five years, a big change. They also believe that BCMA will be used during, which is barcode med administration, will be used during the administration of essentially all medication doses in most hospitals. And we're only about 50% of the way there. So in five years, we're going to be seeing quite a change in technology. They also believe that it's somewhat likely that hospitals will begin adopting automated surveillance tools to identify high-risk patients who need urgent monitoring by pharmacists. And there are some tools out there in the marketplace, some of you may have started to use them, where it helps us focus and target on the patients that really need pharmacist care. So one of the suggested strategies that the forecast participants suggested is that we need to apply EHR, medication use data, is providing pharmacist care for patients. So we really need to be able to understand the data that's coming out of our electronic health records. Again, informatics is really going to be key to us in the future. Drug development therapeutics is another area that's changing rapidly. Current trends are, um, and I think you've seen, I think there's there were three, three of the latest drugs that came out that 
um, where you have genetically targeted therapies where you need a genetic test to determine if you're the right patient that's going to respond to the medication. Um, more and more cancer drugs now are becoming oral. There are a couple different um, oncology related disease states that are primarily if not 100% treated with oral agents and it's expected to continue that oncology will be treated via oral agents or a combination of oral and IV. Hence I think that's going to also increase our need for more ambulatory pharmacists managing these patients in the outpatient setting. Um, and finally, there are some direct-to-consumer genotyping um, trial or uh, tests now, and there are currently more than 200 genetic trials that are commercially available. So you can get your genetics for a very specific um, disease state for about $299. And then there's three companies that offer for $1,000, you can have your whole genome sequenced. So that's going to change the way that we uh, prescribe, obviously, in the future. Participants, participants believe that it's likely that there's going to be an average of two biosimilars approved annually between 2012 and 2017. So we need to start getting ourselves figured out of how are we going to use biosimilars when we're talking about these genetically modified drugs and, and where do they fit in our formularies and how do we monitor for adverse events for a biosimilar drug. It's really going to change, um, I think, the way we look at our formularies. Suggested strategies is that we need to become fully engaged with efforts focused on improving health status um, of the community as the most viable long-term approach to managing high-cost drug therapy is to avoid the drug. <laughs> Right? That's the best way to avoid or to manage high cost drug therapy is to get healthy and understand how do you avoid having to go on that drug. So that's really going to be a key role for us. It's a very big change in the way that we um, have been brought up, if you will, in pharmacy. Finally, in the mar pharmaceutical marketplace, healthcare expenditures on medications continue to rise. Between 2007 and 2011, we saw a 12% increase in our national spend on medications. That's significant. In, um, in 2011, there were 34 new molecular entities that came to market. That was more than any other previous year. Go going forward, it's projected that every single year through 2016, there's going to be an additional 35 new molecular entities approved. So it's going to really be a busy couple of years for those in drug information and formulary management. Um, so what do the participants believe? They felt that biosimilars will reduce our per treatment cost by at least 25%. So we're going to really need to focus on biosimilars and how do we use them and how do we figure out how to appropriately monitor for them. Um, and also it's felt that there's going to be a continued growth in specialty pharmacies and other closed distribution channels um, and it's just going to continue to explode. And, and why is that important? When you start dealing with these closed distribution channels and specialty pharmacies, um, that, that really creates problems sometimes for access, medication access to our patients when they're transitioning in and out of acute and ambulatory settings. So that's going to be really important for us, uh, a trend for us to watch. One of the suggested strategies by the participants was to continue to dedicate resources and establish standard procedures for managing the drug supply. Biosimilar, specialty medications, closed distribution chains. It's really going to um, continue to explode and really challenge us um, in, our, in our acute care setting as well as transitioning to the ambulatory care setting. Let's talk a little bit about the position of the nurse workforce and what's expected in the next um, five years. We certainly have an aging population that's expected to increase our, our demand for physician services by about 22%, um, with only a 13% increase in primary care physicians. So you can see the balance. We think there's going to be a 22% need, but only a 13% supply to meet that need in primary care services. There's going to be an increased demand for nurses in areas such as care coordination. The amount of nurses that we graduate is higher than that 22% need for um, primary care. However, <coughs> nurses are being split into care coordinator roles where they're coordinating care between ambulatory or outpatient and inpatient services. Um, there is going to be an increase in advanced practice nurses. 
uh, clinical nurse specialists, nurse midwives due to the physician shortage. We still think there's going to be a gap in the need for primary care. There definitely is a move, and we're, I think we're already seeing it, towards team-based care models. And when uh, Haney talks about uh, the uh, patient-centered medical home, I think you're going to see team-based care uh, in, in, in pieces of that, because that's certainly uh, where we're headed. And finally, there is a commitment by many professions, including pharmacy, physicians, nurses, dentists, I don't remember all the other professions, um, in interprofessional competencies. So interprofessional training, interprofessional competencies, so that we can actually all learn together, so that we know how to behave and act as a team and care for the patient once we get out in practice. So, participants believe that 50% of chronic care needs in the ambulatory care patients will be provided by non-physician non clinicians who will concentrate on patient assessment, patient education, and the coordination of the patient's treatment. And really, that's the role for the advanced practice nurses, for the NPs, for the PAs. We believe that hospitalists will manage the care of at least 50% of the inpatients in their hospitals. I know that's probably true already in my organization. And at least 50% of the income of primary care physicians will be global or per capita payment rather than fee for service. We already talked about that. They're going to be capitated. So they're going to need to take care of a human life, whether they're inpatient or outpatient. They're going to get a capitated fee for that. Suggested strategies is to develop expertise in our pharmacy departments in improving medication adherence with our ambulatory patients so we can help those physicians keep patients out of the hospital because hospitals are expensive. And then finally, and I think this is really interesting, is that we need to focus on complementing, not competing with patient assessment and patient care coordinator roles um, that the advanced practice nurses. So we can complement those other providers the PAs, the NPs, by not trying to compete with diagnosis and coordination, but really trying to focus on medication, medication adherence, and prevention of medication utilization. So um, I thought that was really kind of an interesting statement. Um, and I believe this is the last domain, consumer-driven health care. Consumers demand for ownership of their personal data. There are now people champ. And now that we can have, um, I don't know if your health organizations have allowed you to have your my chart. That's what ours is called at Beaumont, my chart, where you have your own medical chart. And um, consumers now are starting to say, I should own that chart. The hospital doesn't own that chart. I own that chart, which is really a flipping uh, methodology. So it, it's a different mindset that if I, as a patient, own my own personal data, you don't as the health system. They also, uh, the trends that we're seeing is that there's support for an effective medication use system that reduces drug-related morbid morbid morbidity and mortality. And finally, the value-based reimbursement that rewards providers for achieving specific health outcomes across transitions of care is also another trend. So what do the participants in the survey believe um, from a pharmacy perspective is that most consumers will have financial incentives for their employers for health insurance plans to engage in healthy behaviors. How many people know if their health plan incentivizes you by achieving either specific lab values or achieving uh, not smoking or any of those? Mine does. Okay, so we're already starting to see this, where people are being incentivized for healthy behaviors. In fact, several of the hospitals in southeastern Michigan, uh, we no longer hire smokers. It's kind of a big deal, but it was interesting. Interesting. So, at least 25% of consumers will routine, routinely decide which healthcare providers they use based on published quality data that's available on the web. Everybody knows about HCAPs. Value-based purchasing, I think the newest is costs are out there, of how much it costs for an e-replacement or hip replacement at different institutions. So consumers are going to start to drive and make the decisions of where they're going to go for their health care based on cost and quality. Most consumers will insist on internet access to their personal health data. So most consumers are going to want to be able to get on the, on the web and see their own health record. Um, and that most adults who have primary care provider will communicate routinely with their providers by electronic means. Texting, Facebook, Twittering, I don't know, you guys are younger than me, you know all those other, I know there's 
numerous other ones, but, but that's going to start to become um, a method for communicating. So some of the suggested strategies were to develop programs to reduce drug-related hospital readmissions through effective care transitions. Again, care transitions, we keep hearing that. And finally, to continually improve the medication reconciliation process. Um, how many people have seen uh, patients in your organization that come in with a prior to admission med history and they get put on the wrong drug because the list was wrong? Okay. How many people have seen people leave the hospital with wrong drugs because the first list that they came in on was wrong? Okay. Really important role for us. Really, really important role for us to get our arms around. So we're going to jump way out. We're going to try to be a little bit out there and creative. We're going to talk about what is healthcare going to look like in, in 20 years, maybe closer to 30 years. And then we're going to try to envision what does that mean for us in pharmacy and what does our role look like. Um, the Institute for Alternative Futures is an institute with a group of futurists. And believe it or not, there are people that have careers as futurists. So I, I met them. It's interesting. So they look at things and they decide what the future is going to look like. So it's, they're very creative. It's kind of interesting. So uh, they uh, worked with uh, and they published two, two different reports. Uh, one was funded through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it was a report on health care in, in the year 2032. And then there was a second report on primary care and what that looks like will look like in the year 2025, and that was supported by the Kresge Foundation. So these are available out on the web. Um, they're pretty lengthy, um, but they're really interesting once you start kind of delving into it. So what the Institute did for both of these reports is they developed four different scenarios of what health and health care might look like in 20 years. Okay. Now, um, again, because I did the thing that residents are not supposed to do, I didn't quote every slide, but what I will tell you is I'm going to extract from um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, the report on healthcare, and anything that's in black is from this report, and anything that's in blue is from the primary care report. So I'm trying to marry the two reports in a uh, succinct fashion to make this uh, uh, meaningful. They did an interesting uh, analysis, and this is their grid. I, I know it's a little hard to read, but what they did is they created um, three zones, if you will, which then led to four different scenarios. So they created what they call the zone of conventional expectation. So that's knowing what we know today. If it continues the way it is today, that's what health care is going to look like in 20 years. So in that scenario, um, different states have different programs. Um, there's an increased use in um, insurance. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid expenses are being driven down. It's kind of the same of what you see today, just more exemplified, amplified. Then you're going to see the zone, if I can get this, oops, the zone of growing desperation. This is where we don't want to be. This is where healthcare blows up. It doesn't work. There's a lot of politics involved. Um, people can't because we've broken. Um, our fi the financial spine, if you will, of the nation's ability to pay for health care. Only the wealthy can get health care. Um, there's a lot of disparity with health. We're not utilizing um, primary care services. They can't meet the need. No one else has been able to meet the need. It's, it's just not a pretty picture. Not where we want to be. Um, and then there's the zone of high aspiration. And there's actually two phases here that they, they looked at. Um, and one is really futuristic, really out there. And then the second one is a little bit closer to this line between uh, the zone of high aspiration and the zone of conventional expectation. But the zone of high aspiration really, really elevates the ability for us to consider health very, very differently than we do today. Health is preventable. Health is the way we live. And we use a lot of technology to help us drive decisions about health. So that's where I'm going to focus today, because there's no way we can cover all the different scenarios. <coughs> so um, again, as I said, there's the zone of conventional expectation. That's, that's slow reform, better health, um, and again, in blue, the 
primary care, I tried to marry the two, uh, the, the two reports together, reflects that, um, you know, what, what do we know today and we just expect those trends to continue. So it's just kind of slow reform, we just kind of plug it away. Uh, then, um, again, I said there's the, the one we don't want to go, which is the, gro the zone of growing desperation. And that's health if you can get it. You're lucky if you can get health care, and um, we are not a healthy population in this. And there are challenges that an organization may face, and it's a very challenging future. Um, and then where we're going to focus on is the zone of high aspiration. And, um, Again, there is um, two zones in there. One is the culture of health, and it's a very, very futuristic where it talks about starting from children very young to predicting what their health outcomes are going to be. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about big data, big health gains. And this is where I, I hope we end up, and it really is utilizing data and technology to drive health care and health care decisions. Um, and so that's where we're going to be focusing is on this big data, big health gains in the zone of high aspiration. So, so really, what does that look like? Um, and there are a couple different group, uh, buckets, if you will, that they lumped what this would look like in 20 years. The first is health. And that is that there's a focus on prevention and social determinants that yield dramatic health improvements. We're going to talk a lot about social determinants. Social determinants are where do I live, what do I eat, what are my economics, what's my educational background, okay? Um, in, in the primary care article, what they felt in this zone was that the triple aim, I don't know if you've heard about the triple aim, but it's enhancing patients' experience of care, reducing costs of health care, and improving the population health will be the focus of almost all primary care. And in healthcare, it's believed that there will be per personalized and preventive healthcare supported by data clouds for individuals and communities. And prevention is, and cost-effective medical interventions reduce disease and the, and the demand for medical procedures is actually reduced because we're a healthier population, oops, sorry, we're a healthier population. And that there will be entertainment and education oriented toward improving health. They also believe from the primary care perspective, and Katie's going to talk a lot about the patient-centered medical home, this takes it to the next level, and it looks at a community-centered home, so a community-centered health home. So we're looking at population-based health, not individual-based health. <coughs> we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also believe that social networking with a purpose. So there will be creative use of social networking for health-related purposes. And I've got some kind of fun things we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. And that social de determinants of health are widely recognized as the key to health. So where do I live? What was my education? Um, what are my hobbies and activities? Who do I interact with? Um, you know, what are my habits? Am I a smoker or not? Those are all going to be huge determinants of my uh, health and how I behave. What's the definition of health and health threats in this era? Um, there will be shared responsibility for physical, psychological, emotional, and social well-being. So we're tying everything together. We're not just looking at health as a physical health. It's, it, it's all encompassing. Healthy aging is expected. So we will be looking at healthy aging to slow morbidity, which means older populations. Um, and there will be a focus, again, on social determinants as health um, that leads to a reduction in obesity, chronic disease, and violence. Okay? So, what kind of medical advances do they project? There will be effective preemptive or management of chronic diseases, cancers, um, and a variety of other disorders. There will be an ability to predict when people are likely to get sick and die and how to optimize your health along the way. That's kind of interesting. So, if you know my genome, if you know my social determinants, if you know my genetic background, my family history, and you know my behaviors, could we maybe predict if I'm going to get kidney disease in 10 years and what can I do now to prevent that? 
So that's really where we're looking at. We're going to talk a little bit more about technology and clouds and communities in a couple minutes. But um, again, and this is from the primary care article, they believe that the social determinants um, will be understood and built into care protocols and data gathering. So we're going to start to gather data on social determinants and use that in care protocols. So very different mindset. We don't learn a lot about that in pharmacy school. Um, and again, the social determinants will be the major focus of the community-centered help home provider activity. So communities will come together to help the health and well-being of that community by helping to manage the social determinants of health. It's very different, very futuristic. What's the healthcare delivery model going to look like in this, in this model in 20 years? Is that nearly all care will be provided through integrated health systems, we kind of talked about that already, we're in that direction, that leverage data clouds around each individual. And that community-centered health homes will actively address the social determinants of health in their communities. And there will be widespread use of digital health coaches and monitoring. So everybody knows about the cloud, right? Okay, think about it. I am wearing a pedometer right now. And it links up to my um, iPhone. Okay, so it keeps track of my, my walking. Okay. Um, I use a card at Kroger, right, when I go in to get my coupons. You want to bet they know what I buy, I bet they do, right? Okay. Um, I use credit cards when I go shopping so they know what size I wear. Uh, think about all the data that you probably, that's probably being, and I'm trying to be big brother, being collected. And what if we were able to put that all into a cloud and we were to be able to assimilate communities? So again, individuals and communities who have kidney failure. What if we could load into that cloud all the social determinants, all of the activities, all of the meds, all of the genetics about those individuals and extract from that cloud, how can you prevent your kidney disease from progressing based on all of those different factors? So we will have more data than we could ever imagine, I believe, in this model. It, it's believed um, from the primary care perspective that there will be a shortage of primary care personnel, but there is going to be a growth of team members that help with that. And this is where it's really cool. They talk, these are the futurists talking, that there will be online avatars. Everybody seen the movie Avatar? Okay. No? You haven't seen it? You gotta see Avatar. Okay. Um, and it's believed that everyone could have a personal avatar. So I could have an avatar out there coaching me with my health behaviors based on my social determinants, my genetics, um, my family history, my current activity level. Um, so it's believed that that really is a possibility to have your own personal avatar coach, which will help with the primary care situation. It's also believed that there's going to be 30 million patients with universal access to primary care. That's pretty staggering. Um, also believe that nearly all Americans will be covered and that health insurance exchanges will function well. And most employers, it's believed, will actually eliminate defined health insurance benefits. They might make some contributions that you can use, but they're going to drop what we know today as health insurance. But they'll give incentives for healthy behavior. Um, health information technology, we kind of talked about that already, big data. It's really believed that there's going to be huge application of these clouds, communities, and individual data where we can really draw information from and help people avoid morbidity, morbidity mortality, future disease, future illness. That health records will, be, will provide collaborative space for patients healthcare providers and the public officials and avatar designers. It keeps showing up, so I gotta believe it's true. And that there's gonna be widespread use of biomonitoring, social networking, video monitoring, and everything. I mean, on your iPhone now, I think there's an app for almost everything. You can take your blood pressure and record it on there, you can do your heart rate, you can really keep all your personal data, throw it into a cloud, and see what, see what we can come up with and really figure out how to, how to manage health better. And again, um, it's expected that there's going to be highly effective personal health avatars. Um, 
there's also going to be a lot more um, with the electronic medical record and um, again, health avatars will be supporting individual and community health. All right, so that's a lot. That's really a lot to think about. It really is, is very different from where we are today. So what does that mean for pharmacists? So I just kind of threw out some questions for you to start to think about and think about um, this when you're, you're listening to the other speakers about the programs and they're talking about and how would you do that now, but how would you take it to the next level if these scenarios came true? Um, are we going to have more pharmacists managing chronic disease? I like to say yes, in the next five years we are, but if we get to a point where we've got more improvement in health, hopefully we have less chronic disease because we're preventing health. So preventative health is going to be important for us to get involved in. Will pharmacists get paid for outcomes? Kind of interesting. Um, physicians are going to be paid for outcomes. Hospitals are going to be paid for out outcomes. Are we going to be paid for outcomes? You know, we really believe we need to be responsible for medication outcomes. Why shouldn't we be paid for those outcomes? What, what's going to happen with technology in our practice? Are we going to be communicating with our patients uh, electronically through, I don't know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever the newest wave is? Are we going to be using those data clouds to data mine and try to understand um, the, the best management for a particular patient based on the, the community cloud that they're in? Does a pharmacist, or I'm sorry, does a patient get assigned a primary care pharmacist? Get assigned a primary care physician. Why couldn't you have a, far, a patient assigned a primary care pharmacist? And I, so I'm your primary care pharmacist. I take care of you in the ambulatory setting. If you go into an acute care setting, I make sure your med history is right. I hand you off to someone who's a specialist in the ICU because you've got significant uh, disease process going and they manage you there but they hand you back off to me when you leave. I don't think that's unrealistic. Do pharmacists, again, I just kind of alluded it, do pharmacists follow patients between care settings and consult specialists in those acute care settings? I think that's a real possibility. It's more of a physician model and a hospitalist model, but I don't think it's out, it, it's out there. Um, and what competencies do we need now, and how do we know that we're confident to be able to do that? And I think that's an underlying theme that we all have to grapple with. I don't have the answers, but I think as a profession, we need to make sure we've got the competencies built in to be able to handle these very, very complex therapies, bio, be it biosimilars or whatnot, but also the competencies to be able to understand how social determinants affect health, how do we prevent people from having to go on medications, and how do we get access through these limited distribution chains so our patients don't have interruption in care. So, really? It kind of sounds like Star Wars to me, or Star Trek to me, if you, if you talk about it. I think, wow, that's really out there. 10 years, is that really going to, or 20 years, is that really going to happen in 20 years? And then I started thinking, hmm, what happened in the last 20 years? Well, in 1993, and I was alive then, I was in practice then, okay? I needed, I can't remember what this little, I can't even get this, what this little device was, but I know it held my calendar. I can't remember the name of it. And then I had a pager, and then I had a watch for time, and this is a Walkman, so I could listen to my music. This is a cell phone, so I didn't have to be to the phone. This is a, I think, Polaroid camera. We had a video camera, and we had a computer. I needed all those devices. Ten years late, only ten years later, I need this, and it does all of this. Pretty staggering, if you ask me. So, do I think that what they're what they're saying could happen in twenty years? Yeah, I do. <laughs> After I can look at this, because um, technology is only exploding. So I don't know it's kind of fun. Um, so let's talk really quickly. I'm running out of time quickly. Let's talk about provider status and why is it important to pharmacists. Certainly data proves that when pharmacists are involved in patient care, medication outcomes improve, we have reduced adverse drug events, and we have reduced costs. So that's there, the data's there. If you haven't read the report by um, the Surgeon General's report on pharmacists um, that was published uh, about a little over a year ago in December, you need to Google it, Pharmacist Surgeon General Report, and you will be blown away by the outcomes we've published of what we've done. 
Um, we need to expand access for patients to clinical pharmacy services. There's going to be a shortage of, of patient or of primary care physicians. Uh, transitions of care is very important to our population, help to our finances, and to our integrated health systems. And also, it's important um, that the eligibility for individual practitioners that we can be reimbursed by insurers. So it's really important that we as individuals can be recognized as, as providers and hence get reimbursed so we can continue to provide our services. Let's talk a little bit about nurse practitioners. They, can, they are considered providers now. So how did they get there? Um, well, they, um, w there was a need. Um, to increase or to have nurse practitioners seen as providers because there wasn't enough primary care services. Sounds kind of familiar. Studies demonstrated the value of the nurse practitioner service. Okay, we got two out of three, right? We're right there. Nurse practitioners recognized that direct federal reimbursement as a provider was needed to recognize them as independent, independent practitioners and bill for services. Three. Okay, we got all three of those going for us, right? So what did they do? Nurse practitioners, they established standards in education and credentialing. We haven't done that yet. We have small pockets um, around the country. I think U of M, you have some credentialing going on, um, but there is some credentialing going on. That was established. We're not right there. We're kind of toying around with that a little bit. They utilize their professional organizations to empower individuals to go out and act. Grassroots campaign, which we are working on. Um, they were willing to accept small incremental change. They didn't want it all. They said, we'll take a little bit here, we'll take a little bit here, we'll take a little bit here. They had very aggressive lobbying campaigns. They also had very aggressive grassroots activism. And grassroots means all of us in this room, each of us individually. And they did get provider status after all this work in 1997. It took years, it took a lot of passion and activism by nurse practitioners and their leaders, but they were able to get provider status. So I think we can do it. Um, we have professional organizations that are gathering now, and you've seen hopefully many statements by many of these organizations supporting actively getting provider status. They are starting to fund, they are, cold, they are coming together as a group of united pharmacy organizations to lobby for uh, um, provider status. <laughs> There have been many bills submitted. This is just one example of a bill that was submitted last year on uh, transitions of care. And it was a bipartisan bill. Uh, it did not make it all the way through, but it's hoped to be reintroduced. And it really would cover services provided um, for certain high-risk beneficiaries as they transition out of the hospital. And it includes pharmacists as one of those providers who would get paid for that or be recognized as a provider. So again, uh, we've got our pharmacy organizations coming together nationally to develop principles to describe the role in pharmacists improving care. And these are the three principles that the organizations collectively are working on. They have not approved these, so this is just a very preliminary glance at them. Um, but this is what we're really looking at, uh, getting a coalition of pharmacy organizations to agree to this. Once we agree to this, this is where we're going to start lobbying on. And that's when we really need grassroots effort to contact your congressman. Let's talk about Michigan. Let's just kind of bring it home real quickly. We have over 12,000 pharmacists in Michigan. That's a lot of pharmacists. Okay? We have only 3,000 pharmacies, if you will. Okay? Insurance companies now credential pharmacies as providers of MTM, okay? So your pharmacy, because your PIN, PNI, whatever that number is, um, is what they will credential so that you can bill for MTM services. So that's 3,000 pharmacies are eligible to be credentialed. Pharmacists, and this is cool, are actually recognized in the Michigan Public Health Code as a provider. So we're recognized as a provider. 
which is very cool. That's a big step that not a lot of states do. In addition to that, since 1978, our public health code recognizes that pharmacists can have delegated authority, and I'm not going to read this, but it basically says that a licensed physician can delegate authority to an, an appropriately trained other licensed individual. So since 1978, we've had delegated authority, okay? So we've had delegated authority, and we're recognized as a provider. Wow, how could that, isn't that great? That's wonderful. So what's the problem? Insurance companies have to, every insurance company would have to credential every provider to bill as a provider. Remember I said we've got over 12,000 pharmacists? That is a heck of a lot of workload and logistics. And they're struggling right now, even credentialing dentists. So not all the dentists are credentialed by every single insurer. So, so it's a logistics issue, is really what it is for us in Michigan. Now, I'm not talking about Medicare, Medicaid. That's a whole different animal because that we're dealing with CMS at a national level. So what can you do today is first document, document, document cost savings and avoidance and clinical outcomes. The more we publish, the more we get out there, the more we demonstrate the value that we provide to health care and the well-being of our patient populations. Grassroots effort. Um, certainly, grassroots effort goes a long way. Use the data that you collect and write to CMS about your practice and your outcomes. They want to hear from their constituents. Write to your legislators. Let them know what you do in your practice and the value it provides back to health and the health and well-being of all of our patients. You can actually work with individual health plans to be credentialed and bill as a provider today. I think Katie's going to talk a little bit about bill, some billing and provider status, but you can actually um, work. I'm not sure how willing they are right now, but there's that possibility. Another really key thing is invite legislators to your practice and show them firsthand what pharmacists do. Very powerful. Get them to your site. They are willing to do that. So, I'm planning on working as an inpatient pharmacist. Why do I even care? Why is it important? Well, imagine if you're an inpatient pharmacist and you now have provider status and you can bill. And you can bill for that transitions of care and effectively hand off to an ambulatory care pharmacist. What does that just do for you in the healthcare setting? It makes you a very valuable, even more than you already are, valuable part of the healthcare team. And it's just as important for you to be credentialed and recognized as a provider. In addition to that, as, new, as healthcare reform changes and molds and we talk about filling the gap for primary care, we want to be recognized as the providers who can help fill the gap for primary care. So it is important for every single one of us to really, really um, consider this. If you have any questions, because I am not the expert about Michigan law, um, Karen Jonas uh, from the Michigan Pharmacists Association is more than willing to talk to anybody, help you with anything about provider status. She wanted me to make sure that you had, she's not here today, but this is her email address. Feel free to email her. Um, I think collectively as a group, we can do a lot of good. I think it would be great if we had pockets of people working on different aspects of it. So, I thought this was a great quote by uh, the woman who is responsible for the Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation. Like most people, we enjoy looking back at where we've been, but our real focus is where we're going. The challenge for leadership across all sectors is to begin working together toward this goal. Reset society's trajectory toward a shared future of better healing, hope, and good health for all Americans without delay. Tomorrow will be the front door before today slips out the back. Company is coming. It's time to get America's house in order. So I thought that was kind of a really interesting quote, and I think that really kind of ties it up for us. So how do we prepare? It starts with you. Every single one of us is responsible for our future and our future for our profession. We need to understand and define each of our roles. What's our current role? What's it going to look like in the next five to ten years? And really, where are we going in the future? And where can I provide value? 
document, document, document what outcomes and financial impact you have in your practice. And finally, get involved. Get involved with MPA, get involved with ASHP, get involved with your regional society, get involved um, because that's where uh, we really are focusing on um, getting the grassroots effort. You can get your information and you can help with our organizations kind of push this provider status forward. So, I really believe that you're critical to defining the future of pharmacy practice, and I have all the hope in the world that when I become 65, somebody's going to take good care of me, and I'm going to have a good pharmacist. So, again, these are the suggested readings um, that I talked about. There's another reading uh, that I slipped in here. It's metrics for the second curve of healthcare. It just kind of looks at healthcare, and then there's going to be a gap, and where's the next layer of healthcare? I didn't have time to talk about that, but that's another suggested reading. So. I'm right on time, but we don't have the 15 minutes for questions. But maybe I have two. <laughs> two minutes. Any questions? Yes? You Are you allowed to ask a question? <laughs> You're speaking next to <laughs> um, Can you talk a little bit more about um, credentialing and, and kind of where uh, organizations might be looking in terms of credentialing? Yeah, I think that's still kind of a debate. Uh, from what I see, we're so focused on provider status. Um, credentialing fits into it, but I, I honestly haven't seen anything that strongly supports we have to get credentialed or we should. I think credentialing, from my perspective, credentialing is that stamp that gives us the ability to say we should be a provider. It sets that competency assessment and it sets that um, true um, um, stamp of approval. So I think that there has been some limited success around the country of individuals being credentialed. I've heard of uh, hospitals doing it through the medical staff credentialing and other hospitals um, doing it through how mid-level providers are credentialed. But you know, I can't speak much more beyond that. I don't know if you know much about I haven't done a whole lot of research. I'm on the fence about it, but the more I read about provider status, the more I think it's probably going to be the way that we're going to need to go. Any other questions? I think we have a break. Okay.